What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Ham Radio Crash Course. Welcome to Saturday. It's nice to, ha- it's nice to have you out here again. We're going to be talking to our friend Adam K6ARK, and we're going to be unlocking the secrets of propagation, or at least explaining them in a way that you should be able to use and hopefully find interesting. Appreciate you coming out, watching the show, clicking that thumbs up if you're enjoying it. We're going to get started soon here, so enjoy the memes. Wow, thank you for all the members that are popping up right now. Thank you, Adam. A couple other folks that just hit. Thanks so much. Appreciate the support. All right, everybody. Thanks for, again, clicking on the uh, video there and joining us. This is a live kind of chat thing, so make sure that if you have questions that you go ahead and post them in the chat right there, right there. Yep. And uh, we'll try and answer them live. We'll also have time at the end to take some Q&A as well. Adam's got some stuff to talk about more than propagation, and I do as well. So let's get right into that because we've got a busy show. Ham Radio Crash Course is the home, or the other way around, the hamtactical.com website is the home for the Ham Radio Crash Course for our merch and help support our channel and the podcast that I do with my wife. So if you're interested, hop on down there. We've got a bunch of shirts. A lot of them were designed by you, the viewers and the listeners of the podcast, hamtactical.com, including the FT8 uh, leggings and jumpsuit, which I believe Leia has out there now, which is pretty wild. So I find that very cool. Anyway, (laughs) thanks for checking that out. All right. So a couple of things to hit. This is actually a a really interesting story. So Wave Talkers, he's, he's out here on Instagram and on YouTube. Link is in the description. He supports the Baker to Vegas race, which uh, I want to quote him directly, and I believe this is something that's kind of a well-known, uh, well-known thing. Baker to Vegas is often called the longest pl- police foot pursuit uh, ever. So it's a 120-mile foot race that goes over the course of like 20 sections, and it's usually a team-based thing. It's like thousands of people that come to California and Nevada to go from Baker, California to Las Vegas, Nevada. It actually ends in uh, in one of the casinos in Vegas. Every year, though, amateur radio plays a vital role because there's very little cell phone reception. For anybody who's taken that drive from Southern California to Vegas, you get to a part where there's just like no coverage because there's really nothing out there. So ham radio plays a huge part of it. There's actually a group of people, a group of hams that get together and provide all the infrastructure for being able to connect all the segments of the race together for time, emergency information that they pass, which kind of inevitably happens, whether or not it's the people actually running the race or the many people that are involved as the support structure for the people that are actually running it. Here's a quick little overview video that was uh, posted, I think, yesterday. Communications. This is one of the repeater closer. systems that they use out I'll there. Show you the repeaters. As you can see, uh, Kenwood repeaters. Pretty sweet setup. And uh, with the linking radio, dual power supplies, battery backup, etc. Yeah. So you can see, look at that. Look at that uh, Envis antenna they got there rigged up on the front of that uh, Ford. That's super cool. Well, so what's a cool little piece of information this year, Baker to Vegas, they have a special event HF Windlink Gateway. And I'm talking with Wave Talkers. He and I are talking on Instagram right now. Basically, they're looking for volunteers that can help support the actual race and then people that would be interested to uh, connect with their HF gateway for WinLink. There is an email that is in this video description that you can contact them directly if you'd like to get involved. They're looking for volunteers that uh, will work on any aspect of the show or the the event so just you know reach out if you're if you feel interested i'll post more information as i get it i might go out there and do a couple of you know uh, envis contacts to the gateway station it might be a lot of fun to do that but it is going to be a really busy event so having people there that can help from an amateur radio standpoint for safety is going to be really (laughs) valuable Okay. So today we're talking about propagation and I wanted to play a video. This was actually sent to me today and it was uh, the subject title of the the email was, you know, weird thing happened on 40 meters. And so I want to show this and, and I'll play it a couple of times so you can hear it. 
What's up with that? K4 MWK. Kilo 4 Mike Whiskey Kilo. Audio back. What's up with that? So if you're not hearing it, there's an echo. He's giving his call sign, and then he says, what's up with that? And then he hears, what's up with that, back to him. And it's his own voice. So a couple of things could be happening. Obviously, it could be some Joker doing some crazy audio stuff, replaying what they're hearing on HF. Well, what it could, it could also be is long path propagation, where he's literally transmitting and picking himself back up when he unkeys the microphone, because radio waves travel roughly the speed of light. So he's able to pick himself back up uh, and, and hear his transmission. It could be that. It could be a number of other things, possibly. But that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, very long path, Edward Griffin says, pretty much. But we're going to be talking about that is how do radio waves go to where they're going? A lot of this is probably going to be HF related, but it's it's a very interesting aspect of our hobby. And, and some people view it as as kind of magical. Well, it's not it's there's scientific you know evidence and and repeatable experimentation that we can do and a lot of evidence that we have and adam k6ark is here to talk a little bit about it so adam how are you doing sir i am doing well and uh i thought that video was super cool i i've actually had that happen to me once before i was on a soda summit north of barstow and running actually i think the same rig um it was either the 857 or the 891 and a dipole antenna. I was on 20 meters at the time. Mm -hmm. And I heard myself uh, like a half a second or so after uh, I unkeyed on probably three or four transmissions and then it disappeared. And it was the wildest thing I've ever experienced. I, I really think it was um, hearing, you know, hearing your radio waves coming all the way around the world and and tapping you on the on the backside as it got back to you i i told him i'm like well it could be a lot of things but one of the the really cool the, the coolest thing it could be is if it's actually your signal going all the way around basically um and then you picking yeah. it back up which is super super cool yeah it is cool so a couple of people in the chat fran uh hild hildwine says kark so I don't know if you if you know where Kark came from. That's <laughs> that's what Leia calls you on the podcast now. She thinks yep. your call sign just works perfectly like that. So Adam, what's been going on with you? What have, what have you been? I know you've been busy. Maybe catch people up on what's going on. <laughs> well, I haven't made a video, or I haven't edited a video. I've shot a couple, and they're sitting in the hopper. Um, but I, I spend all my free time putting together antenna kits, working on my three D printed paddle, making winders. Um, trying to keep stock on for you guys who have been voraciously buying uh, the K6ARK small QRP antenna matching unit kits. Excellent. So this week, there's some more stuff showing up on Amazon. I'm going to send these out on Monday. I've got a bunch of winders ready to go. These are the ultralight wireframe version. And then I've got, uh, and they do come with that Velcro strap for uh, securing the wire. And then I've got some of these uh, BNC clip models. Um, I'm going to list these for about eight bucks a piece, so they're pretty cheap. I'm sure they'll go fast, so keep an eye out for them. And then hopefully soon after that, once I get a little bit of stock built up, I've got the portable paddles mm. that are built to sort of imitate the, the design and function of the Pico paddle. Um, they're very similar in size and have a pretty darn nice feel. Um, these will be on sale in the relatively near future. I haven't fully settled on a price yet, but they will be some of the most affordable portable paddles out there. Yeah, and it's literally, well, I mean, you could tell me, but it to, to my eyes, looking at it and playing around with both the, the Pico paddle in one hand and your paddle in the other hand, it's pretty much the same dimensions. And the base plate in particular mm -hmm. is almost a carbon copy, like you can take it and mount it the same way you would on a mountain topper or whatever type radio. Yeah, my, my goal with the base plate design, I, I put some magnets in there with silicone rubber pads. Um, so it gives a little bit of grip on something steel. And it's unless you have a heavy fist, it's it's strong enough to hold the paddle still on a piece of steel, like the case of an 891. Mm -hmm. And um, the slot, the little T slot that's cut in there, if you can see that, is set up so it uh, allows you to position this properly on both an MTR 
a 3B or an MTR 4B and probably a 5B as well, although I haven't tested that one. And that's actually an upgrade from the Pico Paddle. The Pico Paddle doesn't have the T notch that you cut out of it. So that's a little bit more right. universal because that those keys are long defunct at this point. Uh, for everybody that's watching, yep. Adam has a little bit of slow internet today. So there's a bit of buffering you'll hear every once in a while, but he's still there. Don't worry about it. And again, if you have questions as they come along, I'm watching the chat. So I'll make sure I get them uh, to Adam. But Adam, you're here to talk today a little bit about propagation and I, I think there's uh there's a little bit of background to the to the talk that you're gonna give. Do you wanna you wanna mention where it all came from? Sure. So I put this together with a friend of mine, Eric Gruff, NC6K. And we are uh, along with another uh, ham, KI6KU, Dan, we are net controls for um, a net on a local Woodson uh, local repeater in San Diego here on, on Mount Woodson. And it's it's linked to a number of other re, uh, repeaters in San Diego County. At any rate, the net is called the San Diego Ham Forum, and we periodically cover topics uh, that are of interest to the, the general ham community. And one of the topics we did was this uh, propagation presentation. We've also done some solderless antenna builds. We did a solderless end-fed half-wave antenna build. We did uh, some some learning about and some actually practical use of slow scan TV. Um, it's just a really fun net. You can check in via echo link if you're not in the San Diego area or can't reach the repeaters for some reason. But if you want to learn more about it, check out the San Diego ham forum Facebook page. That's kind of the general place for, uh, for information about the group or check into the Mount Woodson repeater. Uh, which is, uh, well, you can find more information on that repeater system, that linked repeater system at Cora, C-O-R-A, radio.com. Cora, radio.com is uh, information about that repeater system. And then that's on Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. local time. Well, now you have my interest. So how do you have a solderless end-fed half-wave? Is it just crimped wires? <laughs> crimped connectors? No, you... So you use a, a BNC to binding post connector and um, basically um, just use that to, to bind the wires together and you build your 49 to 1. And I think Chuck actually oh. built one in a video at one point as well. Interesting. So yeah. the, the, the two legs of the, the binding post have the toroid going through it with the, with the primary and secondary winding. And do you use a capacitor? Well, you know, you should you should probably go check out the San Diego Ham Forum Facebook page because okay. my presentation that I've put together for that is on the page there. You can uh, you can find the the photos in a Facebook post from a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and look through and and figure out how to build it. There you go. That's enticing everybody to go check it out. <laughs> All right, so you got these cool slides you you've got for us, and we're both having a bit of beer. I should show people what I'm drinking since it's very uh, apropos to the topic. Real fast, uh, I have the Mike Hess. Hop cloud, so very uh, propagation uh, related today. So hop and, cloud. And it's got a got a picture of me on there before I had LASIK. Yeah, there. Oh yeah. <laughs> wearing glasses. There's your. <laughs> there's there's Adam for sure. Uh, and yes, I have. That's a true SDR in the background with some with some true problems, uh, which I'll talk oh, about in a video uh, in the future. But yeah, Adam, once you once you go for it. All right. Well, uh, before we jump into oh, the presentation, yeah. I'm drinking a Alpine Duet. This is uh, a local, local San Diego brewery that uh, has some really good beers. They were bought out by Green Flash. Um, I'm not sure what their status is now, but uh, Alpine Duet and and Nelson are a couple of my favorite IPAs out here. So yeah, good IPAs out in Southern California. San Diego, I will say, as much as I'm you know up in the LA County, I have to say San Diego one of the best uh, counties for uh, for beer. I think. And in and around that area, yeah. Yes, indeed. All right. So diving diving into the slides here, uh, the, the, the focus of this presentation is on atmospheric propagation of radio waves. So, you know, Josh has done other uh, streams about um, resonant antennas, radiation, and uh, now we're talking propagation. So once that RF escapes the antenna, is out into the atmosphere, how does it get from here to there? So the the first uh, or the second slide there talks a little bit about the different sort of relevant terms and definitions that'll help us understand how RF is making its way through the atmosphere and why it's doing certain things. 
The first one there is reflection, which refers to a change in direction of a wave at the intersection of two different media or two different uh, types of material. Um, oftentimes in propagation, that might be, uh, for example, the surface of the earth or the ocean. Diffraction, the second one there, is change in direction of a wave passing around the edge of an object, and that can affect radio waves as well. Absorption is the loss of energy of, in a wave as it passes through a medium. Refraction, uh, change in direction of a wave passing from me one medium into another. This is generally how lenses work. So they're bending light as light enters from air into the glass or plastic media of the lens. And then finally, scattering, which is just changing direction of waves in a variety of directions by reflection, refraction, and or diffraction. So it kind of takes a combination of a bunch of those other uh, forms of, of change of direction of waves and uh, just combines them all into a, a, a separate, uh, separate mode or not mode, but uh, a separate means of, of changing direction of waves that we call scattering. On the next slide, we talk a little bit about free space and line of sight propagation. So one thing that's uh, really you know, worthwhile and important to know about electromagnetic waves, which also uh, includes light for that matter, um, is a simple equation for power density. And when we talk about power density, the, the key thing that we want to understand is that the power decreases by an inverse square each time the distance traveled doubles. So each time the distance traveled doubles, you have one quarter of the original power that you started with at that previous step in distance. In the atmosphere on Earth, due to attenuate, attenuation from buildings, trees, and the atmosphere, um, we have pretty significant losses on certain frequencies and less losses on others. But it's important to understand um, that uh, even without anything in the way that you, you have ever decreasing power as the distance from your transmitter to your receiver increases. So on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the Earth's atmosphere, because this is really a huge factor in our RF propagation. The lowest layer of the atmosphere is known as the troposphere. That's at zero to seven miles from the surface of the Earth. The stratosphere, uh, just above that, seven to 31 miles up. The mesosphere above that, the thermosphere above that, and the exosphere as the outermost layer of the atmosphere. And on the next slide, we kind of look at what the most important and most relevant layer of that atmosphere is for most of our propagation modes that we're interested in. And that's the, what we call the ionosphere. The ionosphere has um, heavy density of, of, well, ions that act to actively um, have a greater impact on RF as it travels up to that point in the atmosphere. And that's roughly in the range of around 30 to 600 miles up. Some of these other layers of the atmosphere also play into other modes of propagation, but uh, the ones that affect us the most are typically up there in the ionosphere. So I'm going to kind of work my way up from the longest frequency or the longest wavelengths, the lowest frequencies to the highest frequencies and talk about how propagation typically works for, for each of those ranges of frequencies. So at the bottom end of the bands, we have, you know, the, the well, the bottom end of the bands that hams might even be interested in, shortwave listeners, so on and so forth. Um, we have uh, very low frequency um, and radio waves at very low frequency ranges, 30 to 3000 kilohertz, can, uh, can make it really long distances through ducting in the lower layers of the atmosphere, basically below that ionosphere. 
And what you end up with is, is what's sometimes referred to as super refraction, where those radio waves are just constantly bending around Earth. Because the wavelengths are so long, they're able to, to take advantage of those different densities and different, um, different media in, in the layers of the atmosphere and just continue to bend for very long distances around Earth. Low and media, <clears throat> excuse me, low and medium frequency waves in the 30 to 3000 kilohertz range also take advantage of diffraction and uh, get longer distance ground wave propagation. You've probably heard that term before for how we end up getting longer distance propagation on those lower frequencies. And then it's worth noting as well that even the, the higher frequencies can, uh, in the VHF and UHF range, can diffract around terrain like mountains and ridges. And that's often called knife edge diffraction, right? Right. It tends to have the greatest impact when the, and, and work the best when the shape of the terrain is kind of on the order of magnitude of the wavelength. So if you've got a mm. sharper angled ridge versus a much larger rounded ridge you're you're more likely to get that diffraction with those higher frequencies yeah yeah i had a really weird experience with diffraction at um and and i assume it was diffraction uh that seemed to be the most likely scenario at i, I was supporting a race up in the santiago peak area uh, just south of you there between san yep. diego and la and I was on a ridge between uh, sort of the Corona side, um, Interstate uh, uh -huh. 5 there. Yep. I'm sorry, um, 15 side there. Um, and there was another station supporting an aid station on the Tribuco Canyon side of the mountain on the west side of the ridge. And that's a very steep and narrow ridge there. Yeah, and we call that the blackout zone if you're on the Corona side yeah. of, that, of San Diego. Yeah. yeah. So... So I was up on that ridge relaying comms for these two stations and they're like, well, we can just talk direct to each other on simplex. We can hear each other. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, so somehow, it, you know, from two stations that were maybe, um, you know, six to seven miles apart as the crow flies, they were actually able to talk via two meter simplex over, uh, about a 2,500 vertical foot ridge. That's cool. That's super pretty cool. incredible. Yeah it's, yeah. it's pretty interesting how that bends. And, yeah. So there, there may have been some, some reflections involved in that as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, I think knife edge diffraction was a, a key factor in that propagation event. So looking at the, the atmospheric layers again, there's a, a, you know, we talked about how the ionospheric layers in the mesosphere and thermosphere are kind of the key elements that are most important to us from the, the perspective of long distance HF propagation. And the, the ionospheric layers are, are made up of the, the kind of four key layers. We'll have the D layer, the E layer, the F1 layer and the F2 layer. And during the daytime, those uh, F layers and the D layer tend to build up. Um, uh, well, all of the layers tend to build up during the day with the uh, increased solar radiation. And at night, the layers, uh, um, the D layer disappears pretty quick for the most part. The E layer weakens and the F layers kind of merge into one uh, slimmer layer that's that's less effective and less uh, less robust for uh, RF propagation. So that next slide kind of shows uh, a bit more detail about this. And again, this is kind of uh, typically in the the thirty to fifty mile altitude range above the surface of the Earth, and it's. <clears throat> The, the ionosphere is, is most present, again, during the daylight hours due to the solar radiation and fades out pretty quick after sunset. The, the D layer, the lowest layer in that system, um, can be useful for some uh, refractive propagation, but typically the D layer acts as uh, for the, the, the D layer acts for the most part as an attenuator and absorbs and just reduces the power 
of RF traveling through that layer. And that's the reason low bands like 160, 80, 40, and even sometimes up to 30 meters are uh, only useful for communicate local communication during the day. Um, and ground wave and line of sight signals um, escape that D layer attenuation and can work over longer distances on those lower bands. But uh, the, the lower the frequency, the greater the impact that D layer has on absorption of strength and D layer, the more it's going to absorb those signals on 80 and 160 meters. And they open up at night after that D layer fades out. So there's a question in the chat from Scout75, if you see it, or I'll read it for you. Silly question, maybe, but why are there no ABC layers, or do they just don't really factor in with the RF? That's a, that's a great question, and I don't know the answer to it. So, um, so maybe we can dig that up in the after chat. Um, I'm, I'm going to stick around for, for a while, I'm sure. And uh, I'll have to do some Googling on that in the after chat, because I'm curious now, too. I hadn't hadn't really thought of that before. And as I was looking at this and, and going through it, the, the same thought actually popped into my head. What a, what a fantastic see... segue there, Adam. <laughs> yes, please join us on the Discord after chat. The link is in the description. It's a voice and text chat. Adam will join us. We'll talk about propagation, but it is welcome for all ham radio questions. And believe me when I say we go well off the rails as it gets a little bit later in the evening and we end up talking about all kinds of stuff. But it's a lot of fun, and Adam will be there for a bit. I believe that clouds at some point are going to be a part of one of those layers, and so I guess that can uh, affect some propagation depending on what frequency you're operating on so i'm assuming atmosphere um all the layers affect somewhat it just depends on what we're talking about but we'll we'll look it up <laughs> yeah and it and it particularly depends on the frequencies so um so in again in that that very low frequency and extremely low frequency portion of the bands <clears throat> that rf either gets absorbed by the atmosphere or just kind of um ducts its way around earth mm -hmm. in uh in those lower layers of the atmosphere um or gets absorbed by some of those those uh, those higher ionospheric layers mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um let's see here where was i there there was another question there um why does it fade out uh at night well it fades out because the the solar radiation imparts energy into the, the the atoms in the atmosphere and produces those ionized layers by by driving uh, electrons um, out of some of those atoms there um, so it, it it just produces that ionizing um, that that energy that that's able to ionize the atmosphere up there I think I missed that one uh, Felix Farcorson has a question. We probably is outside this topic, but uh, please join us on the after chat. Perhaps you could tell me if it's possible to hear Australian station from UK on a modest, I'm assuming that's wheeled winter field day setup. That's actually kind of challenging, but there's ways to do mm -hmm. it. Adam might have some thoughts on that as well. And and possibly Mike KMRD will be joining us, and he's also an antenna guy. So uh, those are the type of questions you would really want to join the after chat for. Yeah, I certainly have some some ideas there. Yeah. So um so we're talking about the 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 different layers of the ionosphere. We worked through the D layer which we understand now is is primarily an attenuator. It just absorbs energy, but uh, it can act somewhat as a a refracting layer as well just like the other layers of the ionosphere. On the next slide, we talk a little bit about the E layer and the E layer uh, propagate, uh, e layer propagation uh, occurs at an altitude of roughly 60 to 75 miles. And it's present throughout the day and night, although it does, uh, I believe, fade down somewhat at night. And uh, it reflects HF signals back to Earth. And I, I put reflects in quotes there because it's not actually reflecting, it's actually acting uh, in a refracting way. It's just bending and refracting RF back so much that it actually turns all the way around and makes it back out of the ionosphere and works, it way, works its way back down to Earth. And that same philosophy or same, um, that same sort of fact of physics applies to all of the, the layers of the ionosphere. So kind of a, an interesting uh, little factoid there that 
the ionosphere doesn't actually reflect RF. It refracts it back down to Earth. Like a prism? As so, like a prism would cut light kind of thing? Yeah, so I... I I th I think that's probably yeah th that's probably accurate. Prisms also have uh, some degree of, um, uh, yeah it, yeah I I think it's primarily refraction in prisms as well, just like lenses. Sometimes I confuse. Well, yeah, lenses are refraction, and I confuse refraction and diffraction sometimes. So go to the first couple of slides in this package where you talked about it, and maybe if I paid <laughs> attention, I'd remember. <laughs> yep. So. So yeah, the you know prisms can have some some reflection going on inside them as well, depending on what's going on there. But but for the most part, the the prism function is a, a refraction function. So the next slide talks about F layer propagation, which, as it says there, is kind of the holy grail of propagation for us hams. Um, HF is is it, it, or the F layer is where HF frequencies refract off of the ionosphere the best and give us that really long distance propagation. F1 layer is at about 180 miles. Um, and uh, the F2 layer is just above that up to as high as 240 miles. At night, the F1 layer disappears. Um, the F2 layer retains its ionization, which can result in 24 hour propagation. But the drawback is that the F2 layer requires really significant solar activity to, to build up and sustain. Um, but when it does, things can be marvelous. So you hear all <laughs> these stories about, uh, you know, people that hams that that uh, had wonderful propagation at previous solar peaks. And and I think that's what we have to look forward to in the next uh, few years as we approach the, the peak of the solar cycle here. We need more skip. We're getting in that skip zone. It's time. Let's go. <laughs> Your 10 meters is time. That's right. 10 meters has been hot, though. 10 meters has been awesome. It I've been has. having fun on 10 meters. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so yeah, the, the you know, those, those F layers are heating up, and you can certainly get combinations of – these layers working together to to further enhance propagation. It's not always just one or the other to, to get you where you want to go. Um, and and yeah, 10 meters has been quite good. One thing you may have noticed about 10 meters is that it's been primarily to, to South America when it opens up and sometimes, you know, across the U.S., but generally at, at uh, mid to lower latitudes. And that's, you know, where you've get, got the peak solar radiation, you've got more ionization of the, uh, the F layers there and just increased propagation and, and higher frequencies of refraction as a result. So on the next slide here, we talk a little bit about other relevant and important modes um, of propagation on HF and up trans-equatorial propagation. And I, I saw a uh, message pop up the other day that indicated uh, trans-equatorial propagation may, be, may have been occurring on six meters. Um, sporadic ease, that's kind of a, an interesting E-layer propagation uh, event that, that we see at certain times of the year. And then tropospheric ducting. So we'll dive into uh, the trans-equatorial propagation uh, mode of propagation first. That's on the next slide there. And basically we get this due to what they call the equatorial anomaly, which is sort of a combination of the Earth's magnetic field, um, increased ionization at those lower latitudes, and um, you, you end up with these they call them fountains or really kind of clouds or dense layers of ionization typically around 10 to 20 degrees north and south of the, ge of the geomagnetic equator there and it mostly impacts the higher frequencies six meters and up in the afternoon and evening um, and results in enhanced propagation across the equator so uh Perhaps someone in the chat can post up if they've been able to take advantage of trans-equatorial propagation and or made uh, a really cool contact using that mode uh, of propagation on six meters. 
Um, I don't know that any of my contacts have really related to that, although I guess it's possible that some of those contacts to South America on, on 10 meters may be, uh, may be to some degree related to that transequatorial propagation. So the next slide, we talk a little bit about sporadic E. And that is caused by clouds of ionized atoms collecting in areas of low pressure um, around the E layer of the ionosphere. And they call it sporadic because it's inconsistent and relatively unpredictable. Um, it mostly impacts the higher HF bands, and you can actually get relatively short skip propagation on those higher bands, including 10, 12, and 6 meters, occasionally even higher than that for the maximum usable frequency in those sporadic E clouds. But uh, it's a, really a key mode of propagation on 6 meters. And it most commonly occurs in the midsummer months, July and August. That's when you get kind of the most frequent sporadic E clouds across the U.S., it seems to occur more consistently in the east half of the U.S. than it does in the west, unfortunately, although it does occasionally uh, open up out here for us. And it has kind of given the six meter band the moniker of the magic band, because when it does open up and it, when that propagation works well, it's, it's really magical. It's a heck of a lot of fun. So on the next slide there, um, <clears throat> I mentioned auroral propagation, which we may see a bit more of again with the solar cycle heating up and it also affects the E layer. So you get kind of those similar distances of propagation, I think uh, typically around 1200 miles or 2000 kilometers. And they're associated with solar storms and increased auroral activity. As a result, you'll expect to experience this at higher latitudes um, where you have uh, aurora in the path of propagation in that center uh, sort of skip area. And if you've ever heard signals coming through auroral propagation, they have a very distinctive sound to them. They have a raspy and almost like a fluttering sound to it. Um, uh, as uh, Hayden says, it's sounds almost like you're talking through a pipe, a very hollow sound. It's, it's really a weird sound. Um, I have not made any auroral propagations. Being in Southern California here, that's a, a bit of a challenge. But who knows, with the increasing solar cycle, maybe I'll have a, a chance at that. You just, just so, harken um, back to when your mom was, you know, wrapping presents for Christmas and she had the empty tube and you got it and you picked it up. <laughs> <laughs> It's the didgeridoo of, uh, right, right, of right. ham radio propagation. The only when only when you're transmitting from Australia, though, does it sound like yes, that? Right. Yes. Right. <laughs> That's good. So um, let's see here. Did I get that? Is that the slide? Or are you, did I throw you off? Sorry. <laughs> no, we're good. I, I, I think I accidentally deleted one in here. I wanted to talk about tropospheric ducting, um, but that's okay. I'll... Uh, I'll mention it without the, the slide. So the, the troposphere um, is, again, that, that lowest layer of the atmosphere, zero to seven miles, and it can uh, support some pretty cool enhanced propagation, particularly on higher frequencies. And what, what you end up with when you get an inversion layer, um, warm over cold air, um, typically also uh, different humidity levels in layers of air, you can get much longer distance propagation by having uh, VHF and sometimes even UHF or even microwave frequencies um, get into that inversion layer and just kind of ride that duct refracting back and forth off of the, the layers on either side until they make it to their destination, make it out of that duct and to a receiving station. So you'll see sometimes um, hundreds of miles of propagation across the Eastern US on two meters. Um, and even as, uh, as Hayden can, can tell you about uh, over a thousand kilometers in some cases, uh, or even over a thousand miles across the, the Pacific from California to Hawaii or from the East Coast 
out to uh, islands off the coast of Europe there in a, in a few cases of making these, these tropospheric ducting contacts on two meters and even 70 centimeters. So pretty cool stuff. If you want to know more about some of that, uh, actually Hayden Ham Radio DX was, was on the, the live stream last year and the sporadic e-talk he did was fantastic. I mean, he, we went the full hour just talking about the intricacies of sporadic E and how you can chase it using modes like whisper to figure out when the openings are and where the openings are. It was, it was really fascinating. It gave me a lot of, uh, interest to go experience that. Cause like we're, we're a little far off from that being the time, but I think that the time is right if you're going to start planning to maybe have some antennas set up if you want to play some of that game. So start thinking about that now. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool stuff. And um, Edward Griffin in the chat met, mentioned the Hepburn uh, maps. Yep. And those things are really cool, as well as the, the APRS maps that show where uh, enhancement is happening. And... and you know, what you get out of those, uh, the Hepburn, Hepburn charts are predictive based on weather conditions and algorithms that uh, that he and I'm sure a few others have, have put together and collaborated on. And then the, um, the APRS stuff is all real-time, you know, propagation events that are occurring where um, an APRS receiver picked up a station, knows its location, and knows how far away it was. So it it's able to, to plot a map that shows where... Um, beyond line of sight uh propagation is occurring pretty mm -hmm. awesome stuff yeah so um so the 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 final slide here about uh propagation talks a little bit about vhf and up so those highest frequencies of of uh, uh that that way we, we may be operating on as amateurs and uhf super high frequencies uh up in the microwave range you can um, you can reach well beyond line of sight through terrain reflection so you can point that uh that directional antenna at a terrain feature say a, a rocky cliff somewhere and use that as a reflector to bounce your signal back to another station somewhere outside of line of sight um, refraction can also work as well that knife edge i'm sorry uh, diffraction um, that knife edge diffraction off of sharper terrain features. And uh, many microwave operators have even made contacts using what they call rain scatter, uh, bouncing their RF off of clouds and rain coming out of clouds to, to scatter that RF through uh, refraction, diffraction, and reflection in various directions to get just enough signal to another station that's also pointed at that cloud to, uh, to make the contact. The key thing, though, as you work your way up in those higher frequency ranges, as we talked about with HF, that the D layer is a big attenuator, particularly for the lower frequencies in the HF spectrum. The Earth's atmosphere and moisture are big attenuators to microwave and very high frequencies up in the, the gigahertz range. So, so that's going to start to severely limit the distance you're able to make contacts with those higher frequencies. Yeah, uh, Sean, actually, in the chat, it's kind of an interesting concept, even though, yes, you know, you're you're not necessarily aiming at the clouds, but depending on even the weather of, like, having a low fog cover can screw up with your Arden signals. Um, even, you know, in my case, I aim towards Mount Wilson, which is uh, 45 miles straight shot from me. But what's Mount Wilson's altitude? I don't remember. Um, That's a good question. I, I want to say about 6,500 or 7,000 feet. Good. That sounds about right, yeah. but I, I'll look at the uh, on on a just a super clear day. I've got a really good SNR, but then if it's if it's super overcast and I can't see it, uh, you'll see it just drop. And it, there's nothing else other than just clouds in the way. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. And that's is that five gig or two point four? Uh, it's five gigahertz. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, pretty cool stuff. So to to kind of summarize, you know, we we went through all the 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 frequency bands and and starting from from the bottom those longest wave length frequencies uh, typically take advantage of ducting and uh, refraction I'm sorry um, diffraction to make those longer distance typically ground wave style contacts as you work your way up into the HF spectrum kind of the bread and butter for us hams um, 
the the lower frequencies are heavily impacted by that D layer as an attenuator and the higher frequencies as you work your way up in the HF spectrum um, tend to be impacted less by that D layer. But to get that refraction to work off of the E and or typically the F layers, you got to hit it at a lower angle at those higher frequencies. The higher frequencies, the higher you get in the fre frequency spectrum, the lower the angle um, you're going to be able to, to refract off of those layers with, because it just has less of an impact on those higher frequencies. Let me, let so me go back a little that's bit. That's Yeah. Let, me, let me pull up a picture. Maybe this, uh, was this people? What would be a good one to demo to, to kind of talk? So you're saying the lower, the lower layers, you want a lower takeoff angle. Yeah. So I, I think uh slide eight is probably best. Uh, tell me when to stop. That's I the one that shows the, okay. Next to that one. Okay. Oh, I Back see. One. Yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. So, um, so you, if we look at that chart there and the the leftmost arrow that goes off into space, um, what we're what we're basically seeing there is we're hitting it the the ionosphere at too high of an incident angle, and we're just not getting enough refraction to turn that RF around and send it back to Earth. The lower frequencies in that range are more affected by the ionosphere and therefore are refracted more. So the lower you get in the HF frequencies, the steeper of an angle you can hit the ionosphere at and still have that RF, enough of it, make it back to Earth. As you get higher and higher in frequency, you get less and less refraction, and you get to a point where if you hit it at too steep of an angle, it mostly just bends and still goes off into space and, and doesn't make it back to Earth. That's kind of your, your maximum usable frequency, if you want to mm -hmm. think of it that way. And then your lowest usable frequency between two points relates to how much attenuation that D layer is providing. And if you look at that chart and you kind of think about, all right, well, if, if I hit the D layer at uh, a steep angle, that purple line on there, how much D layer distance wise do I have to go through to get up to that F2 layer and bounce back to earth? Not a whole lot, but if I hit it at a low angle and make my way through the D layer up to the E or F layer, and then bend back to earth at a low angle, I got to travel through a whole bunch of D layer. And if I'm using a lower frequency at that point, that RF is just, isn't going to make it through. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that's why the, those kind of concepts are why the lower frequencies are typically best for shorter range contacts and higher frequencies typically work best for longer range contact, contacts. And that's all within that range of, of the lowest usable frequency, best for shortest range contacts and the highest usable frequency, which is going to be typically about best for your longest range contacts. Oh, very good. Okay, let's go back to the end here. So make sure we get. Uh, by the way, everybody on the Patreon side, I'll drop the uh, slides over there. But if you're watching, you can uh, you can probably Google most of this stuff to get the information you're looking for, or you can reach out to K6ARK. And Adam, where's the best place for people to find you? We'll mention that first before we go to questions. What's where? What's and I take <laughs> that. Let me be very specific. How would you like people to contact you? What's the best way that they can reach out and talk to you if they want to? <laughs> I got to be really careful because I know how. Uh, you you got to be really specific. <laughs> yeah. So so I, I would say probably one of the best and easiest ways is the Ham Radio Crash Course Discord. And if you're not on there, you should be. You're missing out. Um, just send me a direct message there or tag me in a message, and I will most likely see it in a relatively short time frame. If I don't, uh, look me up on, on QRZ or k6ark.com. Uh, my email addresses are on both of those. They happen to be different email addresses, but they both go to the same box and they'll both get to me. That said, I do get a lot of emails, as I'm sure Josh does, and sometimes <laughs> I miss stuff. So if I don't reply, don't take it personal. It's nothing against you. It's just because I'm trying to do far too many things in uh, too small of an amount of time. <laughs> if, if we don't reply, ask better questions. No, 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 that's not it. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> so there is a question in the chat. We'll kick it off with uh, with 
uh, Polineurosec. Polineurosec. He was asking a couple times, or they, uh, she, they, I don't know, um, was asking to talk more about uh, ground wave propagation. I said, well, we kind of did. You kind of covered that in the beginning. Uh, what specifically? And they said, I would like to know how terrain conductivity affects different frequencies and... Any old men doing CW QSOs there? <laughs> so I, okay, <laughs> all right. I mean, but by the way, um, you, you probably know this, Adam, but uh, weak signal stuff, which is VHF, UHF, single sideband, VHF primarily, is alive and well in Southern California. We have a ton of people out there that are always doing weak signal stuff, uh, either single sideband or still CW, still exists on on, uh, on simplex frequencies out here. Yeah, very true. And um, to, to try to kind of more directly answer the question, um, I, I don't know. Um, I, my understanding of propagation is, is at a pretty high, uh, pretty high level. I, I don't know the, the, the scientific details of a lot of this stuff. So my goal is to, to explain it from a, a sort of a user's perspective rather than a scientific perspective. Yeah. And um that's a that's a, an interesting question. I, I really don't know how ground conductivity uh, affects ground wave propagation, or if it even if it even does. Um, my understanding is that that ground wave propagation is is primarily affected through both diffraction and refraction um, from you know the the layers of the atmosphere um, having different uh, different uh, well different media you could say. Um, different contents and then of course the 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 uh earth itself the terrain features being uh, a relative shape and size to the electromagnetic wave such that it, it it bends the wave around the object i'm assuming there's got to be some relation as we know the ground conductivity can affect our antenna matches on transmit. Oh, absolutely. So if it's affecting that, it's probably likely involved with how the RF gets out. I'm assuming there's some relation there, but again, I'm just speculating. It's just my lay person's guessing there. Uh, I, I think he's right, though. There's not a whole lot of people that are talking about the the practical scientific nature of of ground wave propagation. We spend a lot of time talking about HF, you know, I think we really do. And I think that maybe because it's just uh, it's a target rich environment. There's more people on HF. There's more opportunities to talk with people, whereas ground wave sometimes gets a shorter end of the stick because who are you really talking to? You're talking to a buddy that's, you know, could be on a CB radio or a ham radio or, you know, for VHF, UHF or whatever. And you're, if you can't make it on simplex, what do you do? Well, just get on the repeater, get on the, get on the Santiago box and we'll talk there. You know what I mean? Like that's generally what happens. I, I feel. Yeah. It's, and, and I'll, uh, I'll double down on that and just say that two meter simplex is a heck of a lot of fun and, and probably one of my favorite modes to operate be it FM, CW, or single sideband. I've, I haven't really played with FT8 on it. I don't know that there's enough traffic there to do it, but perhaps there is. But just, you know, you, you got to be strategic about it. And it helps to, to find a high elevation location with good view shed to areas that you want to reach out to. But you got to experiment too. And so, for example, one of the things I always do when I'm... Uh, either acting as net control for the the local net here on the repeater four miles from my house, or um, just helps. calling into the net. Yeah, it does. But um, but one of the things I like to do is listen on the reverse of the repeater as well and see what stations I can hear from my house. And it's amazing some of the stations I can hear mm -hmm. that I shouldn't be able to hear. Yep. So that that mountain Mount Woodson is is basically directly between me. And Poway, the the town where probably most of the residents that that uh, call in on that net live, and I have made simplex contacts and can hear people on the reverse, sort of through the mountain. So I, I know that RF isn't obviously going through the mountain; it's either reflecting off of something on the summit or knife edging around or something. I don't know, but um, at, at any rate. That's a really fun way to uh, to experiment with and learn about two meter propagation is listening on the the input to the repeater, the reverse. There, there's a couple of reasons why that's really a valuable thing to do. If you get a lid on the repeater, uh, we have often used the reverse function to say like, I can hear them 
Uh, no, I can't hear him. I know where, you know, so once you triangulate, that's called the rough order magnitude triangulation that you can do with repeaters on the inverse. Plus, there's a lot of radios that actually have a button that you can hold down to listen to the inverse. A, a lot is probably the wrong word. There's some. I think that Kenwood THF6 does it. And a couple other radios I have, there's a button you can press and it'll flip to listen on the inverse, which is which is yeah, really cool. Most. Mm -hmm. it, would you say most? Yeah. Do most have it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I feel like I feel like I don't do it enough that I'm ever seeking it, but I do like to have a channel actually. Um, depending on the repeater I'm on, I'll have a channel for the inverse that I'll set to the B channel, and that way I can see who's mm -hmm. coming in and how strong they are, which is always kind of kind of fun to do. Yeah. All right. So looking for more questions. Let's see. A lot of people having good uh, comments on ground wave connectivity, which is good. And, you know, if you want to continue that conversation, join us on the Discord. Uh, DX, uh, Ham Radio DX, water makes a good ground reflector at HF. <laughs> Ask the people in Florida all about that. Matt and his uh, his crazy get-ups out there. I, I guess, it, you know, uh, for the person that wanted to be able to hear Australia from the UK, uh, ask Matt if he'll let you remote his station because he can hear Australia from Florida sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, so so a couple of the, I, I see some discussion on 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 ducting there, and mm -hmm. the, the tropospheric ducting typically occurs below ten thousand feet or so. That's often where, or most often, where you get those inversion layers that that duct the signal. And there was an an interesting event. Um, oh, probably six months ago, I made a video about it where some stations in the the Los Angeles basin area made contact with a station in New Hampshire uh, over 146.520. And they were obviously very surprised about it, um, but made, I think, about 15 to 20 contacts That's over a, a two-hour-ish time frame. That's a big yeah. opening, too. And, well, so one, one of the stations that, that made contact was um, uh, on a Soda Summit, a friend of mine, and he was running, I think he said, one watt, and uh, roll up J-pole antenna. So, um, so that combined with some other factors made me really make me think that it, it may not have been a natural propagation event, that it may have been what I call eye layer propagation or uh, perhaps a, an uh, internet link that they were not eye aware layer. of. I get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, two so... hours is a really long time for that kind of opening, right? Right, and it was it was also very very strong signal reports were full were, quieting, were pretty receivers. pretty solid and 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 consistent, which which didn't make a whole lot right. of sense. So, so I I really think, and there's no way to to tell either way, but um, oh, I really you, think that was uh, you did a video on that, right? I did. You, yeah, yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, okay, I remember this story now. Yeah, um, that's kind of what I thought too. I'm like, this is a little too consistent and too too good sounding uh you're, yeah. you're uh single sideband when you're really rocking through some kind of tropospheric ducting or or sporadic e it almost turns back into hf where you're running squelch off in some cases and you're really kind of listening into the noise sub to to hear the stations at least from my experience i had one good contact down to down to San Diego, actually, it was a little over a hundred miles, and I was like, "Oh wow, this is you know from my home, just out here on on a two meter simplex." I was like, "Well, oh, I don't know what exactly I hit, but um, it sounds pretty good." And it was you know an S five uh, power level, if I remember relatively accurately. So, yeah, um, <laughs> and the the other the other one of the sort of major issues with with that working as as tropospheric ducting is that there are two very large mountain ranges in the way of uh you know between southern california and new hampshire and oh. those are massive barriers to any kind of tropospheric yeah. ducting so so if it were natural it would have to include probably a sporadic e cloud that was strong enough to to reflect you know 2 meter uh, 2 meter signals and the odds of that being that strong and, and that consistent and only affecting a very small area on the the California end seems pretty unlikely. So that's like a long truck in too, you know, if you think about it. There's that's a whole lot of land <laughs> with a whole lot of yeah. atmospheric condition you need to get to get from one spot to the other. 
Uh, okay, yeah. Bill asks a question. Uh, Adam, can you speak to the prop mode of backscatter? Ah, uh, uh, you know, I don't know much about backscatter. My my very limited understanding is that it relates to uh, essentially using a passive device um, to take in RF and sort of retransmit it. And beyond that, I know very little about it. So, um, so perhaps if someone does, we can uh, we can convince them to join the after chat, and you guys can teach me a lesson. I don't know enough about. I don't know anything about it really. So I'll I'll reserve comment. Could uh, let's see. Could propagation create spurious transmissions on resonant bands? Can I receive a ten meter signal? Someone transmitting at twenty meters because of diffraction? I think no. I've never heard anything like that. No, I'm I'm yeah, I'm not aware of any um, any type of uh, propagation that will will modify the the frequency like that. You know, you do get a little bit of Doppler effect from. Mm -hmm from satellites and things like that when one of the either the transmitter and or receiver are moving relative to each other at high speeds but uh but i i've never heard of any kind of um any kind of propagation that would affect uh, the you know sort of spurious transmissions or um make the transmission audible on another band that would simply be a factor of either the transmitter transmitting spurious emissions or the receiver not being able to to properly uh, filter out um, sort of out of band transmissions if it was listening on the a different band than was being transmitted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't think so. I think I don't even know the Doppler how f speed of movement is not the issue necessarily. It's distance traveled, right? Would be the what would change it. But then at some point, uh, you'd have to be out of the atmosphere almost transmitting into the atmosphere for that i think you wouldn't be terrestrial at that point for that and kind it, of test sure and if if you're getting that kind of doppler shift it's not going to be um it's not going to be that massive it's not going to be on a, a multiple of the frequency you'd have to be moving real fast well yeah but i mean even if you're moving fast if you still if you think about something like uh transmissions from mars they don't really change bands necessarily they're still generally operating in the same base on their way to so yeah i i, I don't know i'm, I'm just bra uh, i'm brainstorming i guess right now <laughs> uh okay ambient oh okay here we go so somebody's talking backscatter ambient backscatter also known as rf backscatter uses existing radio frequency sy sy signals such as radio television and mobile telephony oh so there you go so it's it's running off of signals that already exist your transmitting into that and then backscattering or scattering against something yeah, that, that's already that, there. And that that's what I tried to describe in, in in basically the the whole of my understanding is that it it involves uh using uh, ambient radio waves uh yeah. and a passive device um that isn't um well maybe I guess you could potentially be an active device but it's using the power from the received signal to retransmit uh, oh, okay. Interesting. Oh. I wonder how reliably I could do that with the um, AM station that's uh, three miles from my house. It's 50,000 kilowatt. I wonder uh, how much... <laughs> nice. <laughs> or whatever they're running. Is it... Yeah, anyway. It, KFI is right down the street from me. You, you get? Do you get KFI down at your oh, house, yeah. Adam? The, the transmitter oh, yeah. is three you miles from my anywhere. house. It's three miles from my house. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> that sounds fun. Adam, do you want to mention anything before we wrap up? Because I'm going to close down the show and head over to the Discord. Uh, I don't think I have much else to add. We, I think we covered it at the, the start. Um, I, like I said, I will have antenna winders on Amazon, uh, assuming they don't sell out instantly when they make it up there, uh, probably toward the, uh, the middle or end of this week. If you're interested in some winders for your K6ARK antenna kits, um, I'll have more antenna kits inbound to Amazon as well. And in the relatively near future, probably the next few weeks, some of these really cool little paddles for those of you that want to operate some CW. So will those, uh, those will be hitting Amazon too, right? The paddles, right? Okay. Yep. Uh, quirky QRP was asking in the chat. I don't know if you know ah, him cool. on Twitter, you might want to 
And yeah. He'll message you and see what's going on with that. Uh, cool. All right, Adam. Uh, again, make sure you hit him up on the Discord. We're going there right now, but he's obviously on YouTube. There's some links in the description. I'd love it if you checked them out and follow Adam. At least go check out his website. We did the video. It was uh, a little over two months ago now where we built your, your antenna kit live. Yeah, I did it. No problem. I went in completely yeah. blind. Adam did guide me a little bit, but um, I, I think it's a good kit. I will remind everybody that there is one surface mount. I think that uh, people are greatly scared of the surface mount. It's literally elephants being scared of mice. Uh, if you if you really need it for your eyes, a little bit of magnification is all you need. It's, it's not that difficult. Your standard iron can do it. I, I think you'd say the same. Yep. You, go ahead if I'm incorrect there, Adam. No, it's 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 not nearly as bad as people think. The the hardest part is probably winding the toroid, which is not that hard. I I will say winding toroids. I'll, I'll show my desk really quick. Uh, where is it? <laughs> look at look at the uh, the true SDR. Do you see how many toroids there are? There's thirteen toroids on that bad boy. Thirteen. I <laughs> I don't I don't really like winding toroids. Uh, and that was uh, that was a fun time. I actually turned the solder pot on for that just to heat up nice. the, the enamel wire, so they're perfect, they're pristine. <laughs> uh, but anyway, okay, Adam, thanks again. You can go ahead and start the Discord, get you guys at, uh, talking in there, and I'll join you in a little bit. So thanks for being on. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So let's let's pull it over here to Adam's website. Make sure you go to k6ark.com. Again, the link is in the description. That's where you'll find links to whatever he's building cuz you know, he started out with the with the antenna kits and that'll do the NFED half wave, it'll do the 9 to 1 random wire. So if you're looking for a different type of antenna, it'll even do a dipole. And literally those are the three configurations that he is showing right there. They snap on to your radio, basically, with the bayonet connector if you're running QRP. And he's also got some other projects in the work. See those circuit boards on the far right and the keys that he's working on. So check those out. All right, everybody. I really appreciate you watching. Let me say a big thank you to all my Patreons that help run this channel. I did a recording for the second antenna throwdown. Uh, this week I posted a link or I posted a video about uh, telescopic antennas and I got so many great comments from people. They had a lot of fun with the video. I've now dialed in my testing rig <laughs> or the way I'm doing the testing even better. But a lot of people said they want to see me apply the same test or comparison against the antennas that I've talked about over the years now. So you're a breeze, your signal sticks, all the fun antennas that we've talked about. So I've done that. I've gone back, same setup. I'm gonna compare the best telescopics, which is the MFJ Long Ranger and the Smiley Half Wave. We're gonna compare that against all the antennas that you know and love. And we'll get a comparison of what the SNR is and we'll have a baseline against the stock antennas. I bought a lot of antennas this last month and it was through the support of the patrons here. So I really appreciate you guys doing what you do uh, and having some faith in me, making some videos that, that you might like. Uh, and I hope you do enjoy them. I hope everybody watching enjoys it. So I'll keep doing it. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. But yeah, big shout out to the patrons. You guys literally, hey, Connor, there's that Connor guy in there and cheers to the brew crew. Thank you very much. All right. So again, link is in the description. Just a quick reminder on what Discord is. It's kind of like IRC. You join, you log in. Please download the Windows app or Mac OS at Mac O <laughs> Mac OS app. Uh, or on your phone is fine too. I don't really like the web app, but you get on the server and you scroll down on the HRCC server, scroll down to uh live stream after chat. There's two little things you gotta click on: the hashtag for the text chat and the speaker for the voice chat and then go into settings and set up your voice system, just like you would on Zoom. Ham Radio DX with the Mac OSS. Yeah, the, the Mac Office of uh, Strategic Services, right? Is that what OSS stood for before they were replaced by the CIA? Is that how that works? I don't remember my history on that one. World War II timeframe, I guess. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate you taking your time out of a Saturday to come watch and play around with some ham radio. I learned something today. I hope you did too. Thanks, Adam, again. Make sure you go check out his links in the description, and I will talk to you later. Let me play you out with some memes. See ya. That's not the right one. Cheers.
I bought this stream deck button pushy thing, and I don't use the buttons. If I just used the buttons, I wouldn't have these problems. <laughs> I wouldn't have these scene change problems. All right, everybody, thanks for coming out. We'll catch you on the Discord, 7-3. See ya.